Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. I'm going to discuss today the important subject for anyone who is interested in holding their money in a space that is a little bit easier to transact in, which is stablecoins, about are stablecoins safe? I'm going to discuss DAI, USDC, USDT, uh, RUSD, lots of the other ones, uh, FRAX and, and many others, to talk about kind of the trends in stablecoins and whether you should feel okay there. I'm gonna try and address this from sort of a first principles way of thinking about it, as well as just the other kind of pros and cons. Because I think a lot of people, you know, sell out of their crypto into stable coins and they're maybe sitting there. It's convenient to sit in stable coins because banking sucks so badly today. It's easy to transact in stable coins in many cases, but is your money safe there? That is going to be the topic and it probably is sensible in light of things like the Stable Act and the regulations that are coming down in a bunch of parts of the world, as well as are likely to come down in a bunch of parts of the world. I'm also gonna give you a little bit of an alternative to holding stable coins that uh, a client kind of mentioned that I thought was kind of interesting for those people who want to achieve kind of a similar thing, but without the same, uh, the same concerns. So we're gonna do that. Before we do that, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button, nail the notification bell, Hit the little all notifications so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. We try to produce great content for you every single day. So go and check out some of those other videos. And if you would like help with, you know, international investing, tax optimization, asset protection, getting second citizenships, second passports, second residencies, or relocating, etc., please reach out to me. You can book a call, calendly.com forward slash Michael Dash Rosmer. There's a link in the description below. Or send a message to our websites, offshorecitizen.net or offshorecapitalist.com. Okay. So at a very basic level, let's just talk quickly about what stablecoins are. A stablecoin is a token which attempts to mimic uh, some sort of a stable asset, usually the US dollar. However, there's nothing intrinsic about the US dollar that has to be a stable coin. You can have you know, AUD or euros or GBP or JPY or CAD or Swiss francs, et cetera, et cetera. And there's different ways of attempting to do this. So one of the most basic ways is to essentially hold the underlying collateral. So the kind of the original idea was, okay, we're gonna hold one US dollar for every token that we mint. And because of the fact that we are holding one US dollar for every token we mint, that token is redeemable for $1 and that's how the stability is achieved. Okay, so that was sort of the original idea behind Tether, which is USDT. Uh, it's kind of the basic concept behind USDC. Now, at some point, some of these start saying, well, you know, maybe we aren't holding actually dollars, maybe we're holding bonds or some other collateral. And this is somewhat sensible because you can ask the question, well, hang on a minute, why exactly would we want to just hold dollars? Uh, like, how are we making our money, right? And of course, if you're in one of these kind of backed interchangeable token models, then you're in a situation where you know how you make the money is you take the money that's on deposit and you go and somehow earn a yield off of it right so in this sense this is really not that different from banking so let's kind of give some parallels here to understand a few concepts one is if i'm thinking about the banking system and i'm thinking about is my money safe etc it's really hard to know what's going on in a bank to know whether my money is actually safe one of the advantages of something like bitcoin whether you like the volatility or not, whether you like the price performance or not, is that at least I can verify that I have my tokens, okay? Nobody else has control over my tokens, they're mine. I can go and I can log in and I can see what's going on on the blockchain and I can see that my wallet has my tokens and that's it. I don't have any intermediaries, I don't have any trust, I don't have anything like that, which is really a pretty fantastic thing, right? I would much rather that in a sense than to deposit it with somebody who I have to trust especially when that party is opaque, right? Unfortunately, as soon as you move into a lot of these stablecoin models, you start to get much less clear connection than you have with something like Bitcoin. So you sort of lose out a little bit in that regard, which is you know, interesting. Now, the next thing that becomes kind of a question is, all right, let's say that we do have some kind of collateral. And let, in, we'll talk in a minute about kind of more algorithmic stablecoins coins that are backed by other forms of crypto, et cetera. Right now, let's just focus on these ones that use fiat to back it. You have an inherent uh, added layer of uncertainty in this case, all right? Let's just kind of realize this as a reality. Let's just say that uh, Tether 
or USDC or some party like that uh, is holding supposedly one dollar for every dollar for every token minted, right? Let's say that's their their claim to fame. Well, first of all, you have the risk that comes with the, the idea that maybe they're not actually doing it. Now, something like USDC is audited, USDT is not, it's pretty opaque, it's pretty hard to tell what are they actually holding. There've been lots of rumors about maybe they're actually not fully backed. And of course, there's some other, you know, kind of money printing concerns there because what's to prevent them from printing the tokens first, then going and buying the assets, then retroactively saying, hey, we've got the assets. And, you know, in theory, they can just inflate their, uh, their balances that way. And especially so long as the underlying assets are going up, they're doing great, right? Now, if those underlying assets are going down, not so much, then it becomes a problem, right? They can be in a, a pretty dangerous situation. So there's a lot of, even if you believe, like there are some people who come out and they say, they believe, no, Tether USDC is stable, etc. The moral hazard inherent in that kind of power is deeply concerning. And this is where the moves to regulate stable coins are not totally unreasonable, right? It's not, it basically are functioning like a bank and therefore uh, having some sort of regulatory oversight, especially when you've got this huge moral hazard, seems somewhat sensible at, uh, at least if you're talking about one of these custodial uh, stable coins, right? So let's introduce, so we've got one, pro one risk, which is that these guys aren't actually holding what they say they're holding, right? That's the first risk. The second risk is uh, in a lot of these, they actually have the power to blacklist addresses, etc. So this is not uh, a permissionless system. When you're transacting something like Bitcoin, the whole point is it's permissionless. No one can prevent your transactions. Even though they might say, hey, we're gonna blacklist this wallet, etc. There's some recent, uh, recent updates to the Bitcoin network, which are attempting to make it more difficult to uh, have fun, uh, try to increase the fungibility of Bitcoins and make it more difficult to blacklist wallets, etc in order to keep that permissionless, kind of democratic sort of move. It's actually a pretty good pretty good thing. When you add Lightning Network on top of that, et cetera, you add layers of that sort of, uh, sort of functionality, okay? Fair enough. Well, when you turn around and you start looking at uh, these stable coins, like I said, in a bunch of cases, they have the ability to stop that. This is, you know, another layer of risk that you're introducing in there. What if they do that. What if they're compelled to do it, right? Because you might say, okay, well, we're going to trust the organization. Okay, but do you trust the courts that have oversight over them, right? How does that all work? So this is another concern. The next possible concern beyond that is that you've actually still got all the fiat risk, right? So literally, if the fiat currency goes down, your, the value of your tokens goes down. You have all the banking system risk. If the banking system goes down, you have that risk associated. So you're, you just have to accept that at a very basic level, in many, many regards, you have all the risks of normal fiat plus an added layer of risk by holding these stable coins, okay? Okay, there's maybe a little bit more freedom in terms of transactions as compared with uh, regular, regular fiat because you don't have the same kind of controls on when you send transactions and receive transactions, but still, it's pretty, pretty iffy, okay? So that's something to, to bear in mind. Now, beyond that, let's go and take a look at some other, uh, some other types. So you have something like DAI. I'm generally a big fan of DAI. The concern I have with DAI today is that DAI is like 60% backed by USDC. So, you know, you have a certain risk there. But the idea in DAI is that somebody can use other collateral in order to back uh, that, uh, that stable coin. They can mint DAI in that way. And this is quite interesting because conceivably from a regulatory standpoint, it actually is decentralized. Uh, Maker, which is the uh, DAO, uh, it used to be a foundation and they've transitioned to a full DAO model. Behind the DAI token, uh, actually it has successfully gone decentralized. So even at the organizational level, that is uh, taken away. It's running on Ethereum. Okay, that's great. So there's a variety of these different factors that are pretty, pretty good, right? Pretty, pretty helpful. Once they improve the ability to bring in other types of collateral uh, and move away from USDC, which I was at one of their events in Paris uh, a few weeks ago, and we talked specifically about this subject. It's a big goal of theirs is to kind of, they're aware of the concerns of having a greater concentration of USDC and the exposure that creates to DAI. So, you know, once they shift that, previously it was mostly Ethereum, and there was some concern about what happens if the price of Ethereum collapses 80%, you know, you could have some issue. 
Now there's some others. I interviewed the uh, people behind Ramp DeFi, which is a, another protocol where you can mint something called RUSD. Similar sort of idea. You can deposit a collateral into there. You can then use that collateral in order to mint RUSD. There's a liquidation engine behind that. There's a, a methodology by which it creates returns. And so you've got a few different components to there. It's similar to DAI in that sense. You've also got, I interviewed uh, one of the founders of Ichi, which is the one where you can kind of create your own stable coin. Again, similar sort of idea where you can uh, kind of create it from, from whatever. And so there's a lot of different of these ones where you're providing some sort of crypto-based collateral behind it. Now, provided that this is sufficiently overly collateralized, you know, this seems relatively sensible. It seems like not too big of an issue to, uh, to have that. These are also typically running on the Ethereum network or running on Avalanche or Solana or you know, one of the other networks, Polygon, uh, Harmony, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? So lots of different other networks where this can be running Tron. And that means that you can have faster transaction speeds, et cetera. Of course, again, uh, do you have the vulnerabilities of that network? Yes. Uh, if there's any concerns with that network, obviously that's going to be an issue. Uh, is there a collateral uh, risk? Yes. Uh, but let's just think about this for a quick little second, but from the standpoint of some people are kind of concerned about the way that banks operate. And it's interesting here that you know, if you go down to the bank and you get a mortgage against your property, some people will say, okay, well, the bank created money out of nothing. And that's so terrible. But really, if you think about it, you have actually a real asset. It's not like you've actually created money out of nothing. You have uh, pulled the value from a real asset. You've monetized it, collateralized it, right? And the bank is the mechanism by which you do it. When we're able to do it using blockchain, we're you know, essentially doing it without the need of the bank, right? So in theory, if you have an underlying asset, why shouldn't you be able to collateralize that asset, right? Obviously, the other party has to be willing to accept it. There's got to be some sort of liquidation provision in there. Uh, and it just turns out that crypto, where you have 24-7 markets and the ability to execute contracts instantly, are, is almost perfect collateral, right? It can be tied up in a smart contract, et cetera. Obviously, there's some smart contract risk there. So you do have some risks involved in that. But at least in these cases, you are removing, uh, at least in theory, the fiat risk. Okay, so this is one. Uh, you're removing the banking system risk, that's two. You're removing the centralized control risk, that's three. So these actually arguably are pretty safe. Now this brings us to the third category, uh, which are these completely algorithmic stable coins. The, I did a video a little while ago on Titan, uh, uh, Iron Finance and, uh, and Titan token and all these sorts of things and what kind of happened there. That particular incident highlighted some of the new stuff uh, that has been happening. And there's been a lot of these uh, seniorage coins that have come out. So a lot of these try to have two counterbalancing tokens that they're minting and destroying to try and maintain the price stability. It hasn't worked well in like any of them. <laughs> they're, uh, they're all pretty, uh, pretty bad. However, it is a big area of experimentation. I've talked to some clients who strongly believe that as regulations come in more heavily on stable coins, these can't really be regulated, right? If you have something that's truly decentralized running on you know, a decentralized network uh, and there's no institution involved, right? If you look at something like USDC, you have Circle, which actually just went public or announced they're going public, whatever. I think they actually went public. Uh, you know, that's an institution that governments can put pressure on, right? Here, the idea is you don't have any institutions that government can put pressure on. There aren't those. It's all handled algorithmically. If they can actually crack that, and right now, my advice would be, these are not safe at all, right? You're in a situation where it's very, very risky in terms of the underlying stability. So if I was to kind of rank the safety from my standpoint, I would probably do it as follows. I would probably say, okay, completely on-chain, well overly collateralized tokens. If you look at RUSD, it's at least 150%. And you can choose when you can actually mince it yourself. So you can choose how much extra stability you want and you're the only one who has the ability to free up that collateral, which is kind of interesting. There's a, an interesting model there. Um, so you can go and you can say, okay, perfect. You know, I've got this, uh, this ability to create this token. It's overly collateralized. It's on a decentralized network, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect, right? You've got something that's probably the safest of the stable coins. 
then I would move to something like a fiat-backed one that's actually audited, but such as USDC, that's probably like the second safest. Then I would probably go to the ones that are maybe not so audited, in particular uh, Tether USDT, right? And then I would go from there to these algorithmic, uh, purely kind of experimental stable coins. And that would be kind of my spectrum of safety. Now, nothing is perfectly safe, right? Nothing is going to give you uh, full protection. And it is worth noting that in some cases you have to hold some of these others simply for practicality. So a great example of this is by far the majority of the trading pairs, if you're doing trading, are on USDT. So in my case, I hold you know lots of USDT at any given period of time, uh, simply because of the fact that I'm doing some trading with a portion of my portfolio in and out, and you know that's a certain risk. I kind of figure that in the short term it's not really that great a risk, but over a long term it probably is. And so uh, I prefer to hold, th hold things in DAI or some alternative, but there just aren't the trading pairs there. Uh, as we get more efficient decentralized exchanges, something like Serum, uh, Serum is a decentralized exchange on Solana network, which is built based on order books. Uh, you can execute really fast once you start to implement more order book, uh, sorry, limit orders. Uh, Bancor has introduced uh, limit orders into these de their decentralized exchanges. I just interviewed uh, one of the co-founders of Dodo Finance. They're bringing in their new updates. Uh, some of the, uh, the ability to have limit orders in, uh, in their uh, exchanges. So as we start to see that roll out much, much more, you are likely going to see uh, more people uh, able to migrate over to uh, decentralized exchanges and then trading pairs in something like DAI, uh, in the case at least of Ethereum, make more sense as compared with needing to use something like USDT. Obviously, if you're on a chain like Binance Smart Chain, then it's more like BUSD on HECO, it's HUSD, and so on and so forth. So they you know, tend to have their native uh, US dollar token, but yeah, that gives a little bit of an idea. So would I say it's safe? You know, it's, it depends on which token. I think there's a spectrum of safety, and I think that you need to be aware of the types of risks. I think that it's a little bit naive to believe that your uh, money is hyper safe in stable coins. There is you know, certainly some exposure, but uh, just depending on your goals, you may want to consider where this is. And you have to kind of counterbalance it. I was just looking yesterday and I can be earning 60% APY right now on, uh, it's an RUSD with I can't remember, either USDT or USDC uh, pool. So it's a, a stable coin pool, which is really, really high. So that probably compensates you for some of the risk that's involved there. So anyway, I hope that helps. Hope it gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, the situation. Uh, by the way, just so that you kind of understand with something like RUSD, uh, because one of the questions that I might have is, okay, say somebody, uh, basically what they would do, they would deposit tokens uh, into the system, they would mint RUSD, right? So that those tokens are locked up. What would happen if the value of those tokens dropped? Would the RUSD get, uh, basically like, would it vanish from your wallet or something? The answer is no, what happens is they just uh, liquidate a portion of that collateral so that it always has sufficient amount to back uh, it's going to convert and basically be able to back it uh, in, the, in the pool side. So you're going to be okay from that perspective, at least up to a point. Obviously, there's you know going to be some, some margin where, well, basically the collateral has changed in form. And so you've got to, got to be aware of it. So I hope that helps, gives you some idea. If you have questions or comments, put them below. And uh, I'd love to hear from you about, you know, if there's some other concerns and risks, et cetera, that you're seeing that uh, you'd like to mention. And I'm going to look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.